Bilbo Baggins was a hobbit. He lived in the Shire where life was always quiet and uneventful, exactly the way he liked it, exactly the way all the hobbits liked it. He was a man of routine, and he never deviated from that routine. His house was always orderly. He lived a good, quiet, stable, secure life. And that all changed one day when at night, per his routine, he sat down to eat dinner by himself when there was a knock at the door, which never happens. He opened the door and was met by two dwarves he'd never met before, and they barged their way into his house. A few moments later, a couple more dwarves barged into his house, and then a few more, 13 dwarves in all, along with Gandalf the wizard. And suddenly, the quiet, stable, secure life was interrupted by these dwarves who broke into his routine, took over his house, broke all of those nice, orderly things that he had in place, and left chaos in their wake. Well, as he was listening to their dinner conversation, he learned that the dwarves and Gandalf were about to embark on a dangerous mission to take back the dwarves' home from the fire-breathing dragon, Smaug. And then Bilbo discovered that he was going to be going on the trip with them as their professional burglar. Now, Bilbo wasn't a thief. He'd never stolen a thing in his life. He had no idea what they were talking about. No one had told him about this trip. But suddenly, that nice, serene, stable, routine life was interrupted by a call to adventure. A call, even, to danger. He was being asked to leave everything that was safe and secure, everything that he knew, to follow some dwarves he didn't know to a place he had no idea where it was. They gave him a contract to sign. And the contract talked about all the things that could possibly happen to him, including his flesh being burned right off of him by Smaug. So what would you do if dwarves came into your house and said, let's go? Bilbo fainted. Well, some 4,000 years ago, a similar thing happened in real life to a man by the name of Abraham. Abraham and his family hailed from what is now known as Iraq. And like everybody else in that day, Abraham worshipped many gods. The sun god, the moon god, the crop god, the fertility god. Because in those days, everything that happened in life was attributed to the work of a god. And so that's what he was raised with. That's what made him comfortable. He understood that understanding of life. But then one day, his life was interrupted by a voice. A voice that claimed not only to be a god, but to be the only god. Which was a radical, inconceivable concept at that time. And that voice, as the dwarves did to Bilbo, interrupted Abraham's calm, secure life as he knew it and called him to leave everything that he knew to go to a place he had no idea where it was following a voice he didn't really know and had never heard before. Now the story of Abraham is a compelling one for us on many, for many reasons. First of all, the story of Abraham serves as a transition in the Bible. From the opening prologue, so to speak, Genesis 1 to 11, uh, from the prehistory, time before recorded history, to history, to the beginning of the story of the Jewish people. The first 11 chapters of Genesis sort of set up the whys. Uh, why are we uh, hurting? Why are we sinful? Why do we run from God? What does sin look like? And first 11 chapters of Genesis talk about how because we ran from God, it unleashed a series of curses. Curses that are symbolized through us being banished from the Garden of Eden, through the flood, the punishment for sin, and then through the confusion of the Tower of Babel. So you have these curses unleashed because of our running from God in Genesis 1 through 11. Genesis 12, God intervenes by beginning to bless the world through Abraham. And so we move from curses to blessing. We also begin the story, the epic story of the three great religions in the world, the Jewish faith, the uh, faith of Islam, and Christianity. But the story of Abraham is important for us on a very personal level because the story of Abraham is a living picture of what the journey of faith looks like and the components of that faith. And every journey of faith has these components to it. And so what I want to do for just a few moments is tease out the story of Abraham for you, the journey that God called him on, 
and what that means for the journey that God is calling us on as we follow Jesus. Now, every great journey of faith begins with the call of grace. It begins with God pursuing his runaway children in order to reclaim us, in order to empower us to follow him and live the life that we were created to live. But it is not only a gracious call, one that brings hope and encouragement, but it's a rather daunting one. Because it's always a call to leave behind everything that we believe gives us security to follow God, in our case, to follow Jesus, not knowing where he's going to lead us. We only know who we're following. We don't know where he's taking us. And that can be a daunting experience for a lot of us. In other words, the journey of faith is all about God tracking down his runaway children and by his grace realigning our lives with the cross. Realigning our lives with a new reality, a new security. And as God does it, there are four alignment moves that take place in our lives on that journey of faith. So for Abraham, first of all, he was called on a journey from many gods to one God. Again, at that time, everybody believed in many gods. That's the way that they made sense of the world. If the sun rose, it was the sun god. If the moon rose, it was the moon god. It was what gave Abraham his security. He looked to those gods for care and for life. It gave him in part his identity. And now suddenly a voice comes out and says, there's something different for you. There's a new reality. There is only one God and I'm it. And I want you to follow me. Now, if you read the story, you know that it says that immediately Abraham went. Doesn't have any sense that he struggled with it at all. But you've got to believe that there was some sort of internal struggle with him. Uh, questions like, am I listening to myself? Is that really God? Is that the food I ate last night? Where, where did this voice come from? I've been raised all my life on many gods, and now you're trying to tell me there's only one God? Certainly he had to have questions. But that's the starting point of the journey of faith. It comes down to this question. Who is your God? Who are you going to follow? Because we become who we follow. Now, in the 21st century, most of us don't believe in other gods. We don't believe in the sun god or the moon god or the grass god. Well, I guess in a couple states they believe in the grass god now. But we don't necessarily <laughs> attribute everything to gods. <laughs> you guys are really with it today. <laughs> you were all born in the, the uh, you grew up in the 60s, didn't you? Uh, but we do have gods in the 21st century that we chase after. Gods who call after us and lure us to want us to go in their direction. The God of consumerism. The God of comfort and the accumulation of wealth. The God of body image. The God of rationalism. The God of individualism. And all of these different gods try to lay claim on our lives. But the journey of faith begins when Jesus comes and makes an exclusive claim. A radical countercultural claim. And his call is this, it's me or nothing. You're either all in or you're not in at all. And it is a radical call. It's the call to let go of all other gods. To stop trying to fit Jesus into our lives and doing what he wants us to do when it's convenient, but to fit our lives into Jesus and to go wherever he leads us to go. It is a radical call. But the only way to enjoy and experience the power of the journey of faith is to answer that question once and for all, which God will I follow? Where will I pledge my allegiance? Secondly, Abraham was called on a journey from home to a strange land. Now, in those days, home was really important to those people. It's, it's part of what gave them identity, along with their family and their beliefs and their gods. And for home, the world for them consisted of the little parcel of land that they lived on or in the village they lived in. They didn't really have a comprehension of a world outside. The world was where they lived. So if there was a flood in their neighborhood, there was a flood in the world. If there was a drought in their neighborhood, then the whole world was consumed by a drought because the world was where they lived. And suddenly God calls to Abraham and he says, there's a world beyond and I want you to leave your home, I want you to leave your identity, leave your family, leave your gods and go to a land that I will show you. In other words, he was asking Abraham to make a journey from security as he knew it to radical trust. To trust that this God would take him to the place where real security 
is found. And that is not a journey for the faint of heart. Because we got a lot of things that we think give us security. And then Jesus said, ah, you got to trust me and follow me. And that's where the adventure begins. Thirdly, Abraham was called from a life of the normal to the impossible. His wife, Sarah, was barren, which meant that she, had the, she was not able to bear children. Her womb was dead, so to speak. She couldn't have kids. It was impossible. And then God comes along and he says, I want you to leave all your gods. I want you to leave your home. And oh, by the way, Abraham, through your wife, Sarah, you are going to become the father of a multitude of people. How many, you ask? Well, just look up at the stars in the sky. You see the number of stars? That's how many descendants you're going to have. Now that rocked their world. Imagine the anticipation that this barren woman lived with, that she was going to be a mom, which in that culture was important because a woman's value was determined by the number of children she had. If she had no children, she wasn't blessed by God. If she had children, she was blessed by God. And God is coming along to this barren woman, and she's, he's saying something impossible is going to happen for you, something that goes beyond the normal. You're not only going to have a child, you're going to be the, the mother of a multitude of people. But that promise became increasingly abnormal the older that Sarah got. And now she's 90 years old. Her, her womb is, is still barren. She's beyond childbearing years. And her husband is now 99 years old. The Bible says his body is dead. He no longer has the ability to, to, to do those things that you have to do in order to have... Oscar, are you with me? Okay, if, if Oscar gets it, then we're okay. There's no ability whatsoever to have kids. But there's still the promise. And at the age of 90, Sarah becomes pregnant. Women, can you imagine the rush that would be? Oh. But in that culture, she knows that she is now blessed of God. And she is so overwhelmed by this impossibility that when her little baby's born, she gives him the name laughter. That's what Isaac means, laughter. Because she's in on the joke. They've been called from a life of the normal to the impossible. And when we follow Jesus, that's the life we start living. That's why it's such a rush. Because you never know what's going to happen. It's always unexpected. It's always a surprise. It's always beyond anything that you can imagine. And finally, Abraham was called on a journey from self to others. Genesis chapter 12 begins with God making a covenant with Abraham, a promise, a testament, a, a, a contract with him, that he will bless Abraham, but Abraham will be blessed for a reason. So that through Abraham and his family, God can bless the rest of the world. So that through Abraham and his family, God can pursue his lost children, his runaway children. And so Abraham is called to leave the other gods for the one God for the sake of others. He's called to leave his home to go to a strange land for the sake of others. He's called to leave a life of, of normalcy for the impossible for the sake of others. Because when we're called on a journey of faith, it's never about us. It's about God and him working through us to find his runaway children and bring grace to them. And so when Jesus calls us to take up the cross and follow him, it is a call to move from self to others. Because to take up the cross means we're going to do what Jesus does. We're going to sacrifice our lives for others. We're going to go where Jesus goes, to those who are hurting, to those who are lost, to those nobody else wants to be with. And we're going to bring grace to them, we're going to be grace to them, so that they too can hear the compelling call to the journey of faith. It is an exciting, thrilling, daunting, paralyzing, thrilling adventure. It's not for the faint of heart, but it's for those who want to experience real life. Now, the community of grace has been on an Abraham-type journey for the last nine years. Nine years ago, a group of us heard the call of God to leave our home for a strange land. Our home was a church called Community Church of Joy. 
multi-acre campus, state-of-the-art campus, a beautiful nursery and preschool area, great Sunday school classrooms, state-of-the-art worship center, all the programs you could want, a a seven-day-a-week church. Plus, I had a secure salary, at least as secure as it can be when you work for a church. And God said, I want you to leave all of that, and I want you to go to a strange land called Zuni Hills, and I want you to worship in a gymnacafatorium where you will have three beautiful suites for your children, which are two locker rooms and a janitor's closet. You'll have that building for just a couple hours a week, and I want you to go there and start doing mission and ministry. And in my case, Tim and some of the staff, we want you to give up your salary and trust that this new congregation will do it. We heard the call to leave home and go to a strange land. We heard the call to move from the normal to the impossible. And we've seen the impossible happen here again and again. Starting a church from scratch in three months, putting the whole organization together, starting with zero in the bank, voting and then to build and then building a $6 million campus in the midst of the worst recession our country has experienced in generations. And we did it with 350 people on average in worship at that time. That was nuts. We've given away over $1 million in the last nine years when we started with nothing. We have moved from the normal to the impossible. And we heard the call to move from self to others. Because we knew in starting that church, and we know to this day, it's not about us. Yeah, we're, we're here because we want our kids to be cared for, and we want our spiritual lives to grow, and we want pastoral care. But it's ultimately not about us. It's about all those people who live in this area, who live around the world, who don't know Jesus yet. That's why God has called us to do this. And so we've been willing to step up and sacrifice financially. We've been willing to step up and sacrifice our time for the sake of others because the God of creation has called us to do so. It's been an exhilarating journey. It has been a hair-losing journey. It has been a thrilling journey. It's everything that you can imagine. But we're just getting started. We ain't seen nothing yet. When you read the story of Abraham, you recognize that receiving the promise of God and going on the journey, having a baby at age 99, that was just the start of it. There's a whole Bible that continues of one impossibility after another, and that's the period that we're in as a church. We're just getting started. And so we have a choice to make. We can hear the call and sit on the sidelines and watch other people enjoy all the fun, or just turn our backs and go to what's safe and secure and stay in the shire. Or we can hear that call of grace and empowered by grace, we can take up the cross and follow Jesus on the bold, daring, reckless adventure of bringing grace to the world. Ready to go? Then let's pray. Heavenly Father, we have heard the call of Jesus who went on that journey before us through death into life. And now calls us on this unexpected, surprising, great, thrilling adventure. Give us the courage, give us the grace to say yes, to take up the cross and follow Jesus. As individuals and as a church, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.